On October 10th, 1901, 120 years ago, almost to the day, the grandstand was full at the horse track in Gross Point, Michigan. But not to see horses. There was a parade of more than 100 of these new things called automobiles and several other events, including races of automobiles with electric engines and with steam engines. But the main event was a race of gasoline automobiles. By the time the event took place, it didn't look like it would be much of a race. There had originally been 25 contestants. Only three made it to the starting post. Then just before the race, one broke down and had to withdraw. So there were just two cars driven by the men who had built them. One was the country's most famous car manufacturer. The other was a local, a failed car manufacturer named Henry Ford. This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadaby. At the time of this race, the most famous car maker in America was Alexander Winton. He had made and sold hundreds of cars. He had gotten tons of press driving from Cleveland to New York. At the time of this race, Henry Ford was a failed car maker. He had made and sold a handful of automobiles, but his first car company had failed. It was clear who was going to win this race. Moments prior, Alexander Winton had set the world record for the fastest mile traveled in an automobile, going around the dirt track in a little more than a minute and 12 seconds. Winton's car was 70 horsepower, Ford's was 26, he had never taken it on a turn, and it didn't have brakes. The race was supposed to be 25 laps, but just before the event, the organizers shortened it to 10. According to Richard Snow, author of I Invented the Modern Age, The Rise of Henry Ford, they probably didn't want to see the local loser lapped over and over. This race was more of a sprint. Has this ever happened to you? You pass by a construction site for months and there's nothing going on. There's just a wall with a project logo peppered with graffiti. Then one day, there's a six-story building frame there. Now each time you pass, it's gotten taller. There was no visible progress for months, then there was rapid progress. You saw what I call the foundation effect. The foundation effect is the delay in your progress as you build your foundation. You have false starts and failures, and it looks as if you're going nowhere. But once you have your foundation built, you progress rapidly. Henry Ford, the failed car maker, won the sprint. But it wasn't until much later he also won the marathon. Eight years after that race, Henry's Ford Motor Company released a car that changed everything. It was durable enough to make it over rough country roads lined with horse-drawn wagon tracks. It was versatile enough farmers could use the engine to run a weed thresher or move hay bales down a conveyor belt. It was twice as good as any car out there at half the price. The first year, they sold 10,000. The second year, 20,000. A few years after that, they sold almost 200,000. By the time the Model T went out of production nearly 20 years after introduction, the Ford Motor Company had sold nearly 15 million. More than half of all cars in the world were Fords. Meanwhile, Alexander Winton's company kept building custom cars, made to order. He just couldn't compete with Ford's Model T and had to shut down. Despite having over 100 patents on automobile technology, few today have ever heard of Alexander Winton. How did Henry Ford create such an incredible car that sold in such incredible quantities? He built a rock-solid foundation. Over and over, he rejected the mere illusion of progress to scrap everything and start over. As a creator, you may feel as if you're getting nowhere. You're starting projects but not finishing them. The ones you do finish are failing. You're throwing iterations in the fire, like Radcliffe Hall. From recent episodes, you know creative waste is part of the process. You're building the underwater part of your iceberg, so some future masterpiece will be that much better. But you're also building your foundation. The foundation of a building holds it in place. Even when the building sways in the wind or shakes in an earthquake, the foundation is there to bear the stress. 
architects and engineers can design a foundation using knowledge about the laws of physics. Many buildings have been built before, so there's a lot of collective experience to draw from. You, as a creator, need to build your foundation from scratch. It's what makes your work unique. As a creator, your foundation is made of the change you want your work to make, the medium through which you'll make that change, and the process you'll follow to make your product. These things take time to develop. It will look as if you're getting nowhere, but once they're in place, like a skyscraper once the foundation is laid, your progress will be rapid. To build your foundation, you need to clarify your vision and master your execution so you won't topple over. Here are some ways to do that. 1. Keep shipping. 2. Don't just build, experiment. 3. Walk away from failures, guilt-free. 4. Have a vision. 1. Keep shipping. This seems counterintuitive because when a skyscraper goes up, they only build one building. They aren't putting up a few stories, scrapping it, and starting over. The reason they can build a foundation to support the skyscraper is millions of other buildings have been built before that skyscraper. Architects and engineers can design a strong foundation because they have tons of data. You need to collect tons of data about your unique way of doing things. How do you get it done? How do people react? Does it express your unique point of view? What is that point of view? Overall, how do you make what only you can make? Henry Ford's hit car was the Model T. Why was it called the Model T? Because he had already built the Model S, the Model R, Q, P, O. You get the idea. He started with Model A. It took until Model T to build the foundation for stratospheric success. The way you build your foundation as a creator is to keep shipping. Remember, shipping is a skill. And each time you ship, you make your foundation stronger. Two, don't just build, experiment. It's funny that when most people think of Henry Ford, they think of the assembly line. A bunch of guys on a line, each doing one tiny job such as placing a nut on a bolt or merely turning the nut on the bolt. But for Ford to create those tasks, he first had to design the product that could be broken down into those tasks. Ford treated each car he designed and built as an experiment. He made them as good as he could, but knew they couldn't be perfect. They were going to break down or have annoying maintenance requirements that needed to be improved. We can design buildings that don't collapse because other buildings have failed. Ford made new and better cars because his cars failed. That's how he improved the transmission, lubrication, and spark plugs. That's how he found a steel alloy that would be lightweight and strong, and countless other improvements to the design and manufacture of his cars. And that's how, even as he improved the Model T, he kept making it cheaper. When he introduced it in 1909, it was $825. 16 years later, inflation be damned, it was only 260 3. Walk away from failures, guilt-free. Henry Ford wasn't afraid to quit. Yes, he went from Model A to Model T, but that was in his third car company. He had one failed company before the race, and after he won that race, he gained enough notoriety to attract investors for his second car company. But he walked away from that company, too, only four months later. By the way, Ford went from A to T, and not all those cars were introduced to the public. Many were internal experiments that he walked away from, or, if you will, iterations thrown in the fire, like Radcliffe Hall's drafts. 4. Have a vision. You can't walk away from failures for no reason. You can't learn from experiments if you don't know what you're looking for. You need a vision. You don't have a crystal clear vision from the start. That's why you're doing all that shipping and experimenting and quitting in the first place. Why did Henry Ford walk away from the car company he started after the race? it wasn't going to help him carry out his vision. Ford had a vision to create an affordable automobile for the masses. His investors, on the other hand, wanted to build high-end cars for the wealthy. The company wasn't a foundation that was going to help Ford achieve his vision, so he stepped back to build a foundation that would. If you're frustrated with your progress as a creator, maybe it's because you're still working on your foundation. If you're scrapping iterations and walking away from half-finished and failed projects, make sure it's in the pursuit of a vision. If it is, keep learning until you get it right. Once your foundation is in place, 
The sky is the limit. Thank you to our newest Patreon supporters. Thank you to Pravin Shaker, Philip Putnam, and Cheko Nije. One thing I've learned in over a decade as an independent creator is to invest in ideas. They really are everything. Most of them don't work out, but the ones that do can be big. I had one idea that led to a book deal and transformed my life. I had another idea that connected me with a company that later sold to Google, which brought a surprise payday. Big ideas start small, and the place I share my ideas first is my weekly newsletter. It's called Love Mondays, and each week I share a big little idea about how to break through to become a true original and make it as a creator. I also share my favorite quotes and books and tools for thought. Think of Love Mondays as like a shot of creative fuel to start off your week. There's several thousand subscribers. We're having a good time. Join Love Mondays at kdv.co slash newsletter. That's kdv.co slash newsletter. You might have noticed I don't have ads on Love Your Work. I haven't had them for a long time now. In fact, a big company whose name you would definitely recognize offered me money to advertise in this show recently, and I had to turn it down. Why? Because some money feels good, some money feels not as good. When I see that somebody bought one of my books, that feels good. When a company advertises on the show, I mean, it's money, but that doesn't feel quite as good. Another kind of money that feels really good is the money I get from my Patreon supporters. It feels like an honest exchange. It's a vote of confidence that they like the show. Since I myself support a number of creators on Patreon, I know it feels good to vote with my dollars and support the kind of work I would like to see in the world. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Make the kind of podcast I want to listen to and share the ideas I want to see in the world. So if you like the show, a great way to let me know is to support the show on Patreon. Even a few bucks a month helps. It really adds up over all the dedicated listeners and it motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing. If you'd like to support the show, visit the Patreon page at patreon.com slash cadavy. You'll see the different levels and perks available. Even if you're on the fence, check out the page. Again, it's at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash cadavy. Thanks for your support. Love Your Work is brought to you exclusively by our Patreon supporters, including top supporters Jeffrey Mason, Bob Rosen, and Pravin Shaker. The theme music for Love Your Work is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadaby, Inc. Inc.